Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Puris coming to you from Baltimore. France remains under a state of emergency following terror attacks last Friday that left 129 people dead. As the country considers adopting new anti-terrorism laws, its police force conducted over 100 raids across France in search of suspects. This comes as the G20 wrapped up its summit in Turkey with an agreement to cooperate on policy towards eradicating ISIS. And on Tuesday, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry met with French President Francois Hollande. And here is some of what he had to say. We have to step up our efforts uh, to hit them at the core, where they're planning these things. Uh, and also, obviously, to do more on borders and in terms of the movement of people. But the level of cooperation could not be higher. Uh, we've agreed even to exchange uh, more information. Uh, and I'm convinced that over the course of the next week's dash, uh, will feel even greater pressure. They're feeling it today, they felt it yesterday, they felt it in the past weeks. To discuss these developments, we are being joined from London by Loretta Napoliani. Loretta is an economist who specializes in international terror financing. Her most recent book is The Islamist Phoenix, The Islamic State and the Redrawing of the Middle East. Loretta, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Loretta, in our conversation today, I would like to get beyond the conversation about radicalism, extremism, and ideology behind it, and discuss the roots of the Islamic State, both in terms of their financing and in terms of their foreign policy. So you've been tracking their financing for a while. How is the Islamic State uh, finance, how do they raise their money, and uh, of course this is somewhat of a changing phenomenon. So give us a sense of uh, where they get their money and where they've gotten their money in the past. Well, the Islamic State uh, is a state uh, and therefore it funds itself uh, as a state uh, through taxation. Every single activity, um, economic activity, commercial activity that takes place inside the territory that controls uh, is tax. Um, so even for what concern the sale of oil, for example, um, the actual uh, smuggling of oil is not done by the Islamic State, but is done by the population which lives into, inside the caliphate. Um, the tribal leaders are in charge of this uh, business and in exchange for that, they pay uh, a royalty, you could, uh, you, you could define as such, to the Islamic State. So this is the structure. And because it is a war economy, um, of course, there is a lot of black market, there is a lot of smuggling, uh, there are all of this activity, including, of course, criminal activity. For example, the smuggling of migrants. So if the migrants cross the border um, from Syria to Turkey, um, in the crossing, which are controlled by the Islamic State, then the traffickers pay a tax for each single individual that is smuggled um, to Turkey. Uh, with the same vehicle that they carry these individuals to Turkey, they come back, the smuggler, with goods that then are sold on the black market, and they pay a tax on that also. So, for example, these kind of activities generate about... Uh, $500,000 per week, which is, you know, quite a considerable amount of money for a country that is a war. So uh, if you add that up, about $2 million a month doesn't quite seem enough. And from what I understand, that some of the financing also comes from some of the Arab states. So can you describe for us what some of those money financing routes might be? Uh, well, the financing from Arab state uh, is something that happened before from 2011 you know, until you know, 2013 when the Islamic State was able to conquer a territory big enough to become self-sufficient. Um, now today, uh, we may have funding coming from individuals that still live in these countries and of course these individuals uh, 
are funding the Islamic State as a sort of investment, uh, thinking that you know possibly uh, in the near future it will be a new political power, and therefore they want to maintain this kind of relationship. But there is no funding at all coming from Saudi Arabia officially, say from the government of Saudi Arabia anymore from Qatar or Kuwait, for example. Um, so it is much, much more difficult to, to stop the funding because, of course, being self-funded and being funded in the same way that a state does, um, there is very little we can do about that. And Loretta, how much uh, is the ISIS financed or how much are they involved in drug trafficking from the region? I don't have any information about drug trafficking at all. Um, they are, uh, again, they do tax uh, uh, trafficking of smugglers of various type, but not of drugs for sure. Uh, in fact, I would say that inside Islamic State, uh, the official policy, it is you know, not to have any drugs. Now, there are several indications from people who have been, uh, especially have been um, uh, in places that have been abandoned by the Islamic State, so after like Kobane, for example, uh, whereby journalists uh, have discovered uh, drugs, uh, in particular we're talking amphetamine, uh, which is what they, is used generally in fighting. But officially, I would say that the Islamic State is not involved in drugs uh, and definitely is not involved in smuggling of drugs from Afghanistan, for example, to Europe. And uh, Loretta, the other one thing that concerns um, everyone is, of course, the, um, the fact that the Islamic State is uh, having such a huge and uh, broad impact now at the borders of uh, Europe. How much of this smuggling of uh, people and the money that they're making from it um, also a way of infiltrating into Europe? Well, I don't think that um, the Islamic State uh, needs to use uh, the migrants to infiltrate Europe. The network of European uh, young people who have been radicalized uh, is actually you know, quite large. So these individuals are already in Europe. They have European passports. So I really doubt that uh, this information is correct. Um, I know that there have been reports uh, from Paris about uh, fake passports, um, but this is something uh, um, that a, a lot of these jihadists, uh, um, which we may define as European jihadists, uh, use fake Syrian passport to move around because they don't want to use their true identity um, that will make it easier to be detected by the anti-terrorism. So um, that would explain why there was you know, a fake Syrian passport. Uh, for what concern um, the fingerprint of one of the individuals has not been confirmed yet that this was indeed one of the people who uh, participated in the attack. Uh, I would think that uh, the Islamic State has everything to gain by projecting this image, because of course that will uh, create more tension in Europe and what they want to do is create chaos, of course, but also it will block the European countries from taking refugees. So people will be trapped inside Syria and inside the Islamic State and then will be forced to be part of you know, this state. Now, Loretta, the G20 meeting is taking place in Turkey, and you saw in the opening mm -hmm. uh, uh, John Kerry making a statement about what has come out of it. Do you think G20 as a group will be able to address uh, the issues faced by uh, Europe and in terms of dealing with I ISIS? No, I don't think so. I don't think the G20, the G20 will achieve anything, to be honest. Um, as usual, uh, they will 
discuss all these issues without reaching uh, um, an agreement about uh, a true strategy. Um, the real impediment here is the fact that you know we have other problems of foreign policy, you know, which are linked to uh, reaching a common decision in Syria, in particular, I'm talking about the relationship between Europe and the West and Russia and the situation in the Ukraine, and also uh, what is the role of NATO um, in relationship, not only to the Ukraine, but also to the Baltic Republic. So until we resolve these problems, I'm afraid there is not gonna be any agreement on what to do in Syria and in Iraq. Um, I know that everybody, you know, the entire world hopes that they will achieve um, a solution. They will present the world with a solution, but I don't think this is going to happen. And Loretta, finally, is there any way to strangle the financial uh, aspects of um, ISIS and therefore containing its growth by cutting off the... Uh, uh, refugee uh, exodus or in terms of uh, breaking their supply lines in terms of the oil industry? No, I uh, I don't think it's possible to do anything. We've been bombing now for 16 months. Um, so uh, I, um, I should think that they've been bombing also the oil fields. I mean, uh, we don't know exactly what's happened there because, you know, we don't have any Western journalists. Uh, so we are relying upon the propaganda that comes from the social media. And also we rely upon whatever, you know, the U.S. or the coalition forces are telling us. But, you know, reading what happened in the last uh, few days, uh, I'm a bit surprised that, you know, that they are now targeting uh, the convoys carrying oil. Why didn't they do it before? Um, I, I really think that being a state and being a state um, which is uh, very much sustained by war economy, the only way to starve its financing is to pacify the area. All right, Loretta, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I know you're very much in demand right now, and I, I appreciate you uh, coming on the Real News Network. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.